my right hand. And from this we abstract the idea of to be and not to be, is and isn't. But when we consider being with a capital B, this includes not only such is's as celestial bodies, but also such isn'ts as the space that encompasses them. And these two go together, as we shall see in more detail as the time goes on. But now a perfectly logical person would therefore say that the notion of the self, the Atman, as the fundamental reality in which everything else exists is meaningless. And of course, from a logical point of view, it is. But at the same time, just because something cannot be put into a logical category does not indicate that it isn't real. The self, you see, bears somewhat the same relationship to the world as the diaphragm of the speaker in this radio bears to the music you've just been hearing. None of the music was about the diaphragm and nobody said anything about there being a diaphragm. The diaphragm as such didn't come into the picture and yet it was everything in the picture. All those different noises were vibrations of this thin film of metal. So also with your eardrum, so also with the apparatus of your eyes, so one might ask then, just as you say, well, what is it on? What is the music on? Is it on tape? Is it on a speaker? Is it on a drum? Whatever the variations may be, we can ask the question, what are you all on? What is all this on? And the Hindus answer, it's on the self. self in each one of you is really at root one. Just in the same way that uh, you have all over your body millions of nerve ends. Each one of those nerve ends is as it were a little eye because all the senses are fundamentally one sense. They are various forms of touch. And the most delicate of the forms of touch is, of course, the human eye. Then the ear, and so on down the list of the senses. Now imagine then every little nerve end is a little eye. And it gets its impression of the world, but it sends it all back into the central brain. Well, in a somewhat similar way, every person every animal, every what the Hindus call sentient being. And even rocks are regarded as sentient beings in a very, very primitive form, right down to the lowest. So all those forms that we see may be looked upon as the eyes that look out of one central self. Only, of course, in the body, in the human body, we can see the connections between the nerve ends and the brain. It's much more difficult to see the connection between one individual and another. If they're married, that's a little bit closer. But just all us human beings rattling around, we're not even rooted to the ground like trees. And therefore, it's very easy for us to form the impression that I am only what is inside my bag of skin. And that myself is a different self from yourself. And we're all, therefore, fundamentally disconnected. And so your 
apparent disconnection, the fact that you are not tied to other people with umbilical cords or some kind of uh, wiring that gives you one mind. Nevertheless, we do have one mind in the sense that, uh, for example, all of us turn out to be approximately the same shape. Two eyes, two nostrils, a mouth, two hands, two legs, and so on. A haiku poem, Japanese haiku, says a hundred goods from the mind of one vine. And so it is with people. And so it is with everything in the world. That's just from a purely physical point of view. But going yet deeper, we find that it's somehow a necessity of thought that there be some sort of a something which is the common ground of all these universes, all these galaxies. And that ground is the self. Now that's quite a startling point of view. Because what it's saying is, you see, that you are basically the works. Now, the Hindus do say that the self, the great self, is consciousness. But of course, that does not mean consciousness in the sense of our ordinary everyday consciousness. Ordinary everyday consciousness is indeed a form of this kind of consciousness, shall we say a manifestation of it. But then there's also consciousness which doesn't notice, but nevertheless is highly responsive. The way your heart beats, the way you breathe, the way you grow your hair, you're doing it, but you don't know how it's done. So therefore, just in the same way that conscious attention is not aware of all the other operations of the body, so in just that way, we are not aware of our connection, indeed our identity, with the fundamental self. When the leaves die and fall off the trees or the fruit drops, next year, more leaves, more fruit. So in the same way, when you and I die, more babies later. If the whole human race dies, you bet your life. There are all kinds of things that feel that they're human, scattered throughout the multiplicity of galaxies. Because this universe is a peopling universe, just as an apple tree apples. But because we are unconscious of the intervals, we are not aware of the self with our conscious attention when conscious attention isn't operating. But still, just as you don't notice what your pineal gland, say, is doing at the moment, so in the same way, you don't notice the connections which tie us all together, not only here and now, but forever and ever and ever and ever. The difficulty and the basic reason why we don't notice the self 
is that the self doesn't need to look at itself. A knife doesn't need to cut itself. Fire doesn't need to burn itself. Water doesn't need to quench itself. And a light doesn't need to shine on itself. So this is the fundamental problem of having some sort of awareness of the self. Nevertheless, it is the whole contention of Indian philosophy, especially what we call Vedanta, that it is possible in a certain way to become aware of oneself in this deepest sense, to know that you are the totality. And this experience is the real substance of Indian philosophy as a whole, both Hindu and Buddhist. It is called moksha, which roughly means liberation. Liberation from the hallucination that you are just poor little me. To wake up from that kind of hypnosis and discover that you are simply something, your organism, your physical body, your conscious attention, which is your ego, that you are something being done by this vast, indescribable self, which is out of time which has no beginning, no end, it neither continues nor discontinues. It's beyond all categorization whatsoever. And so the Upanishads say, all we can say of it positively is the negative. Neti, neti, it is not this, it is not that. Anything, therefore, you can formulate, imagine, picture, will not be the self. So when you are trying to know the self, you have to get rid of every idea in your head. It doesn't mean, as some people seem to think, that you have to get rid of every sense impression. It isn't as if you had to go into a catatonic state of total absorption. Of course, that can be done. But the full moksha, the full liberation, is when you come back out of absorption and see this everyday world just as it looks now, but see as clearly as clearly can be that it is all the self.
can become aware of this tremendous interconnectedness of everything. And that is what somebody who is moksha, who is liberated, sees. He sees, shall we say, that everything goes together. And that is, in a way, what we mean by relativity. Because relativity means relatedness. Just as fronts go with backs and tops with bottoms, insides with outsides, solids with spaces, so everything that there is goes together. And it makes no difference whether it lasts a long time or whether it lasts a short time. A galaxy goes together with all the universe just as much as a mosquito, which has a very short life. From the standpoint of the self, time is completely relative. You can have, if you scale it down, as much time between two of those very rapid drum beats as you can in eons and eons and eons. It's all a question of point of view or, to use a scientific expression, level of magnification. It's very important to understand not only the relativity of size and of time, but also of what there is. Now, as you know, the human senses respond only to a very small band of the known spectrum of vibrations. We know through instruments of quite a vast spectrum, but we, as I say, with our senses, see only a little of it. If our senses were in some way altered, we would see a rather different looking world. We can do this, of course. We can put on special lenses uh, to enable us to see heat. And then we see all the heat radiations coming out of people. And uh, we say, well, I never noticed that about you before. But so in the same way, you see, there are infinitely many possibilities of vibration and of organs sensitive to those vibrations so that there could be worlds within worlds within worlds, spaces within spaces, just like the many, many wavelengths of radio and television going on forever and ever in all directions. The possibilities are infinite. But having senses and noticing is a selective process. It picks out only certain ones, just as when you play the piano. You don't take both arms and slam down all keys at once. You select. And so perception is a kind of piano playing. It is picking out certain things as significant, that is to say, as constituting patterns. And the whole universe seems to be a process of playing with different patterns. But whatever it does, whatever it plays, in whatever dimension, on whatever scale of time or space, it's all on the self. Self is also known in Sanskrit as Brahma. This is a neuter word. Brahman 
is from the root BRH, which means to expand, to grow. It isn't quite clear exactly why this word was chosen. Sometimes there's a still better word for uh, the self, which I like, is the word tat. Almost like tit for tat. Tat means that. We get our word that from the Sanskrit tat. And so when the baby comes into being, first of all, the first thing it says is da. Da. Uh, the baby is pointing. Da, da, da. And it's saying that. Look, isn't that marvelous? That, you see? So that is the witch than which there is no witcher. And so you get the formula in this Brihadaranyaka uh, Upanishads. Tat, van, asi. Which means? That, that, who am, that is, you know, uh, you, I see, uh, you are that, or that thou art, that art thou. So, in this sense then, every self is modeled on and is an expression of the one self because you all feel individually that you're the center of the world and everything else is seen in circles, circling out, sphering out from where you are. And that's as it were, the called the microcosm, the little cosmos. But then in the same way, the macrocosm has a central self, although this is not central in the way we talk about centers in space. Do you see that? Uh, the center of a circle is in the middle of the circle, and the circumference is away from it. But you could say, you could use a phrase that the Christian theologians have used of God, that circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. You could speak of Brahman that way. It isn't in the middle of the universe, spatially speaking. You might ask the question, where is the universe? Ever thought of that one? Where is it? Well, you can't say where because all, everywhere has to be in relation to something. There would have to be another universe to say where this one is. But then since those two together would constitute the universe, uh, we wouldn't still be able to say where it was. It isn't anywhere. And so in that sense, the center isn't anywhere in space locally. And furthermore, the kind of space we are dealing with is only one possible kind of space. It's the kind of space our physical organisms are attuned to. We are, you see, like the radio. We pick up what wavelength we're on. So then, when inquirers used to come to that great modern Hindu saint, Sri Ramana Maharshi, and they'd ask him all sorts of silly questions, like, who was I in my last incarnation? What will I be in my next one? He would always reply, 
who is asking the question? Because that's the thing you need to know. As it were, dig down into the depths of your being and say, what is this? One of the very fascinating questions. It's also, it teases us out of thought to think about death in the sense of going to sleep and never waking up. Imagine that. And you find you can't. And yet, it's, it's, a, it's a thought that although you can't get to grips with it, it remains fascinating. Also the question, how is it suddenly that you awakened into this world? Where were you before? In Zen Buddhism, they have the meditation problem, the koan. Before your father and mother conceived you, what is your original nature? And that's the same sort of weird question as what it would be like to go to sleep and never wake up. What was it like to wake up having not previously gone to sleep? It's very mysterious. But as you go on, and plumb this question, you begin to develop the feeling That your existence is exceedingly odd. In many ways odd. Odd because it is here and it so easily might not have been. After all, if your father hadn't met your mother, would you be here? Now, of course, somebody would be here, because he might have met somebody else. Would that be you? 
Of course it would. Don't you see? You can only be you by being someone. But every someone is you. Every someone is I. That's your name, you say. Uh, it's me. I am here. And everybody feels that I in the same way. case of it. Coming out from the, in quotes, central eye, like so many tits from the belly of a sow, or so many spines from a sea urchin, so many legs from a spider. And that is, of course, why the images of the Hindu gods are shown with many arms or many faces, because it is saying that all arms are the arms of the divinity. All faces are its masks. nothing to worry about because the, the the important you is perfectly indestructible it's what there is our comings and goings our fortunes and misfortunes are a sort of mirage the more we know about them, the more we know about the world the more diaphanous it seems and therefore, everything in the world has the characteristics of smoke. You know, when you blow a cigarette or pipe or something in a cloud of smoke and you see it in the sunbeam, and it's full of walls and designs and all kinds of marvelous things going on, and then slowly it disappears. Well, everything's just like that. Now, there are two attitudes you can take to that state of affairs. You can say sour grapes. It's all a lousy, wretched trap. And I, here I am, I'm given all these feelings of love and attachment and joy of life, and then I fall apart. My teeth drop out, my eyes become feeble. I get cancer or cirrhosis of the liver or something, and then it all falls apart, and it's too bad. But on the other hand, a weaving of smoke can be very beautiful. Provided you don't lean on it. Provided you don't try to preserve it. Catch hold of it. Then you destroy it. So exactly the same way, there's nothing in the way of form that you can lean on, that you can grasp. And if you see that, then the world of form is very beautiful. If you let it go, to love people, you see, if you're a husband and wife, you, you must let each other go. Otherwise, the marriage is either going to break up or it's going to be held. If you love a person, you say to that person, look, I love you, whatever that may be. I've seen quite a bit of it, and I know there's lots that I haven't seen. But still, it's you, and I want you to be what you want to be.
So when the, the Hindu and Buddhist philosophers speak of detachment from all this apparent world of separate beings, detachment means going with this whole thing and not resisting its change. And you can afford to go with it. You can afford to get mixed up in life and to fall in love and to get involved with all sorts of things. things. You could afford it if you know that it's an illusion. But this is not illusion in a bad sense of the word. Here's this Hindu word, crucial. The world is called Maya. This word Maya, yes it means illusion, it means magic, it means art, it means delineation or measurement. So from matra we get meter. We also get matter, material. Isn't it funny that when we say material, today we mean something very real, whereas the root of the word is illusion. <laughs> so you see, I mean, measurement is kind of an illusion. You don't find inches lying around. <laughs> you can't pick up an inch. <laughs> so. In, in the same way that hours and inches and pounds and uh, dollars and so on are actually imaginary. <coughs> there are uh, elaborate systems of cosmic bookkeeping with their little scratches on paper, little hairlines on dials. So in exactly that way, the distinction between things is maya, is imaginary. But what an imagination. In a way, to say that the world is maya is at the same time to say that what lies behind maya is immaterial. Look at the reversal of the world. Oh, it's immaterial. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters? all this. But that gets us to a deeper point yet. The, the self, the real self, doesn't matter. Which is another way of saying it doesn't exist for any purpose. It doesn't need to exist for any purpose. What purpose would it exist for? When it's what there is. It doesn't need, it won't find anything in the future. There's nothing in the past that it has to go back and remember. It's now, an eternal now. And so in that way, it doesn't matter. But therefore, the most important thing in the universe is the one thing that doesn't matter, the one thing that's totally and completely useless and that nobody can find anything for. Once a Zen master was asked, what is the most valuable thing in the world? And he answered, the head of a dead cat. Why? Because no one can put a price on it. So this self, the Brahman, is like the head of a dead cat. But you see, if then you say, hmm, 
I uh, really ought to get that dead cat's head because um, something spiritual about it and uh, it'd be very good for me. After all, if I, if I knew the self, I might be a better person. People might like me more. I'd be more constructive in society. I would uh, do this, that, and the other. But you see, that's putting the cart before the horse. That's trying to make the tail wag the dog. The knowledge of Brahman, the self, never does anybody any good if they're trying to make it do them some good. Only when they're not concerned with whether it does them any good or not, does it do them any good. Like when you relax and you go out and play. Americans in particular don't know how to do this because they're always justified. They always say it's good for me, it's exercise. It is to change from work and that'll be able to make me work better. See? Everything they do is done for some serious reason. It's the Protestant conscience. And so we never play. It's a very exceptional. Because play is that which is done just for itself, for fun. So the self, the Atman, the Brahman, exists for fun. It has no reason to exist. It's completely useless. And uh, it is, therefore, Maya is linked with the word Lila. And that means play. Also, of course, the word illusion in English is derived from the Latin ludere, play. So the nature, you might say, of the self is that it does no work. It only plays. Work is something serious, you know, that you do for a purpose, because you believe that you've got to go on living. You work to survive, because you think you have to survive. That was one of the things they told you as a little child. You've got to go on, man. But you don't have to. <laughs> this thing doesn't have to go on. 
That's why it does. I know that sounds paradoxical, but uh, there's so many things in life that are like that. If I'm trying to impress people, I usually don't. If you try too hard with anything, you usually make a mess of it. And so this basic thing then is that the self, the Brahman behind the world, is engaged in play. This, it is in this sense that the Hindu philosophers say, Brahman does not actually become the world. The meaning of that is, he is playing at being it, or it's playing at being it. So, you must remember, of course, that the word play and the word game have many levels of meaning. We are accustomed to use the word play in opposition to work and to regard play as trivial and work as serious. Very largely, a game or a play is something in, associated in our minds with triviality. You're only playing with me, says a girl to a suitor. You're not serious. How serious do you have to be? When does one get serious in a flirt flirtation? When do we say this is getting serious? When you're holding hands, playing footsies under the table, kissing, petting, sleeping together, married and babies. Maybe that's serious. <laughs> but uh, we also use the word play in a non-trivial sense. I went to hear Heifetz playing the violin. Was that a trivial matter? On the contrary, the very highest kind of art form, still play. I say too, when I do philosophy, like I'm doing with you, this is entertainment. But in the sense, perhaps, I hope, of your listening to someone play a musical classic. I'm not being serious, but I am being sincere. The difference, you see, between seriousness and sincerity is that seriousness is someone speaking in the context of the possibility of a tragedy. That there is a situation where things might go absolutely wrong. And then I put on the expression which is serious. That's why soldiers on parade are always serious. They don't laugh. And when they salute the flag, they put on a stern expression. That's why in courts of law and in churches, people don't normally laugh because all that we deal with here is very important, a matter of life and death. But the fundamental question must be brought forth, is God serious? And obviously the answer is no, because there's nothing to be serious about. said also that the self as conceived the supreme self was quite useless that it was immaterial it doesn't matter 
exists because it transcends all values of what is better or worse, what is upwards or downwards, what is good and bad. It so weaves the world that the good and the bad play together like the black and white pieces in the game of chess. So, play is deeply the sort of thing children like to do with deep absorption and fascination to drop pebbles into the water and watch the concentric circles of waves. Or mathematicians. Mathematicians, you know, uh, especially what we call higher mathematicians, are entirely lacking in seriousness.